Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about um, rhinoscopy here and just some very basic concepts. And you're very welcome to interrupt at any stage and ask some questions. I'm happy to do that. And for our audiovisual guys who's recording it, I'll try to repeat the question if that happens. So I think this is very important. The reason we do rhinoscopy and CT scans is because there's an enormous amount of difference between these two scans. You know, for me, this one here shows someone who might complain of an enormous amount of blockage in their nose, mucus production, carry tissues around, and that would be really typical for many rhinitis conditions. But their sinuses are completely normal. That's different to this person over here who has chronic sinus inflammation. And they do actually subtly differ differ, and I think understanding rhinoscopy is really important to separate them out. For example, here, uh, rhin rhinitis is a condition of the nasal airway, whereas sinus dysfunction really involves the sinus cavity. And people can present surprisingly very similar. So you, people can present with blockage, a lot of discharge, but that doesn't mean they have sinusitis. Um, it may be a condition that's only happening in the nasal airway. And what do we see? So in rhinitis, we, we see things like vascular engorgement of turbinates, it's a typical hay fever sufferer. They might get this cobblestoning that you begin to see on the, uh, in the lining. This is sort of glandular hypertrophy. And then they start to get little areas of what we call jelly-like edema on the turbinate heads. Now, some people erroneously call these polyps. They're not. It's just jelly edema of the actual airway tissues. That, but that's very different to people who have sinus disease. So people who have sinus disease have a degree of mucosal inflammation actually occurring in their sinus cavity. Uh, so someone who typically has terrible hay fever will have a completely normal sinus scan. And in response to that terrible inflammation, they start to get these hypertrophic changes, what we really truly call nasal polyps or nasal polypoid tissue. And you said, why do these form? Well, it's thought to be an inflammatory process and fibrin deposition that actually contributes to why polyps in the lining get so thick. And then you could imagine in a system that's a, that's a box of many different caves that requires mucociliary clearance, eventually that mucociliary clearance becomes dysfunctional, mucus gets trapped, cilia gets impaired, and they often present with sort of secondary microbial colonization. The propagating factor of why some people continue their sinus disease, you know, varies amongst these three things, but it's a very different condition than just simple rhinitis. So when you see these two scans, they're, they're not the same person in terms of disease entity. How do we pick them apart? So we do CT scans, we do endoscopy, we see some of these changes. And in my opinion, a lot of the sort of key features of a rhinitis reaction is someone who complains of nasal obstruction, itch, sneeze. They almost always, especially in the setting of IgE-mediated disease or allergy, have other areas involved, conjunctival, skin symptoms. And, and the relationship with their lung involvement for a simple inhalant allergy person is really with childhood asthma. Childhood asthma is predominantly an IgE-mediated disease for the majority of, of patients. That's different though to sinus disease. So sinus disease, we see the mucosal thickening. They don't have a nice, this is now the middle meatus for those of you who aren't familiar. It's all on the left hand side, septum. This is turbinate, which is that structure there, not, not so swollen. And you have this middle turbinate. This middle meatus, you look at it and you often see this thick hypertrophic tissue, which is nasal polyps in someone who's not co-infected. And because of these changes, as opposed to a rhinitis change, Smell loss is really common. If you said to me as one of the few symptoms that has a very strong positive predictive value for sinus disease, it's actually loss of smell. So terrible hay fever sufferers will still tell you they can smell okay, but a little bit of sinus inflammation, they often lose their smell. They complain of nasal congestion. And there was a great paper just recently published in JAMA. It's very important because when we say congestion, it's a very different concept for many patients than what the doctor thinks. I think a lot of ENT surgeons think it means blockage, but patients will sit there and say, I get terrible congestion. And you say, can you breathe through your nose? And they're like, no, sure, no problems. And what they're really describing is a heaviness of fullness in their face. And that's what we see in sinus inflammation. Um, likewise, they get mucoid discharge. This, they get these infective exacerbations because their sinus cavity looks like this all the time. And the relationship with asthma here is generally with adult onset asthma, which doesn't have simple IgE mediated or 
type 1 hypersensitivity driven um, origins. Putting these all together is how we then make the diagnosis of what happens in the upper airway. So let's talk about some radiology. Um, and just very quickly, those of you who are familiar with radiology, you don't need to have big helical scanners to do simple sinus scans. These little cone beam scanners are available. And the reason we do that is because they offer a really tiny millisievert dose. And you know, it's important to, to understand you know, having a simple scan is worthwhile because many of these patients, we might do one or two scans for them in the process of managing their sinus disease. So we're keen to reduce their x-ray risk as much as possible. Patients now find this out. If you go to x-rayrisk.com and type in, I'm having a sinus scan times two, they'll quantify your lifetime cancer risk that's uh, incremental based on that exposure. So it's, and, and that website's actually quite informative for doctors as well because it really puts in perspective the, the concept of minimizing radiation dose for our patients. It's good for patient implants. We have one in, in the office. It minimizes a second trip. But most importantly, it's this one. Having a scanner nearby where you've got a radiologist who's willing to do it on the day that you've seen the patient or if you've got one in your own setting like we do in our clinic, it totally changes your understanding of when someone comes in and says, I've got facial pressure or congestion. And when you marry it up with endoscopy, you can usually give a patient a very accurate answer about what really is happening in their sinuses. Now, this is what a normal sinus scan would look like. Obviously, nice black air-filled sinuses. The turbinates di differ. So this person's had a decongestant spray beforehand. Can you see how their turbinate, whoops, my apologies. See how their turbinates are plump here? Well, if you spray their nose with decongestion, the turbinates will look really thin. And sometimes one turbinate will look bigger than the other, and that's got to do with the nasal cycle. So I, I'm always cautioning people about making much of a judgment about turbinate size and shape based on a CT scan. I think that's much more accurate on endoscopy because there's so many factors that affect that. But when you do have true sinus disease, you'll get this diffuse thickening in the sinuses. It's not just a little thickening like this on the floor. Very common as people have endodontic work, previous tooth restorations, people develop a, what we call myxoid edema here on the floor of the maxillary sinus. That's not an inflammatory change when it's isolated like that. So, very cautious about looking at minor changes. You usually have to have diffuse thickening for it to be a relevant change. This is perhaps more typical for someone who's got true sinus disease. You know, you'll see this sort of diffuse pattern on both sides. Um, simple cysts like this, see this cyst here? You'll see this all the time. Good radiologists usually dismiss these. But sometimes radiologists, when they've got absolutely nothing else to say, you know, they just can't bring themselves sometimes to say it's a normal scan. They, they just describe everything. And they say, oh, there's, there's a nasal, there's, most good radiologists call it just a mucus retention cyst because you've got completely normal mucosa and then there's bubble. Now, in ENT worlds, we, these are completely dismissed. We see mucus retention cysts when we do surgery for other reasons. They are just a simple cyst like this person having an operation for some other reason but it's a good opportunity for me to ha show you show what a cyst looks like. You can see how the rest of the lining of the sinus is completely normal. So they're really not considered a an abnormal finding. And when you pop them, they just have this sort of clear fluid in them. And they're, they're often referred to as a mucus retention cyst, but they're actually an extravasation cyst. We're a little serous gland, instead of secreting onto the surface of the mucosa, is actually secreting um, underneath. And they come and go in life. And so if you see these, they're not clinically relevant for the majority of patients. Um, and we're, we're relatively dismissive of them, but we make sure that uh, you know, radiologically and then on endoscopy, there's nothing else happening. Um, most people have true nasal polyps though, because the understanding of polyp disease is that it, it, polyps don't occur in isolation. They are a byproduct of inflammation. Inflammation has to occur that creates this fibrin deposition and in doing so, you must have an inflammatory reaction happening somewhere. And so people who have polyps often have scans like this. They've got diffuse inflammation going on in their sinuses. Sometimes you will see a perfect little polyp, like that's why I have this picture. But usually on CT, it just looks like an inflammatory change. Um, if you see an isolated polyp like this, this is a tumour. So this is, you shouldn't have a polyp form in the setting without sinus inflammation. Um, so this is an example of a tumour. Um, sometimes you'll get this, try to ignore the stent that was left in this person's head over 10 years, and just have a look at this bone thickening. Can you see the sort of fluffy bone? 
Some people used to call this uh, bone infection or osteitis, but it's really not. It's just a reactive bone change from chronic inflammation. And although it's something you do see post-surgery because of the trauma of surgery, it actually happens primarily in about 30% of patients. So you'll see this funny, fluffy bone thickening occur. And, and this is what we call neo-osteogenesis. Um, this is a remodeling event. It's not actually represent infection or, or even inflammation in the bone. So there are many remodeling events that occur. So basement membrane thickening and fibrosis you know, can occur, as well as bone thickening. And you can sometimes see this sort of bone thickening. And here's somebody who's got really thick bone thickening and someone who's never had surgery or anything else done. And this is just an example of a reactive change to chronic inflammation. And when you look at it, they get this normal lamella bone and they get all this thick woven bone laid down over the top of this little woven bone there. And it can usually be two or three times thicker than the normal bone. And there you go, there's an example. This is from one of our studies many years ago, woven bone, and there's the normal lamella bone. And you don't do anything about it. It's not something you treat. It's not an indicative of some bone infection. There's no bugs there. It, it really is a, a, a sign or a flag of sinus inflammation rather than a problem in itself. So let's talk about endoscopy. And I'll go through it quickly because I know we're on, a, we're on a short brief this time. I'm going to talk about these things first, the nasal valve, the septum, the turbinates, because not everyone might be familiar with this. Th this is a picture when I trained as a medical student that I was given of the nose. You know, and you're like, well, there's the floor of the nose, that's the inferior turbinate middle, is a sphenoid. But the reality is that no one gets this view. You know, the, the only the person who gets this view is the coroner and maybe the occasional head and neck surgeon. So, so it's not really relevant, right? So this is what's relevant. It's, it's understanding what we're looking at when you're looking in the nose of someone who's um, in front of you in the office. So if you said to me, at this level here, this is someone's CT scan, at that, we're, we're at the piriform aperture, and you look in the nose, this is what you see. So you can actually see this inferior turbinate hanging off the sidewall. There's a middle turbinate in the distance, but that's what's <laughs> happening just here. You can see the inferior turbinate. But you should actually take a, stop, a step there and look back because when you look at that point there, I'll just play this little video out. You might be looking at, you're looking at this entrance here to the nose. And I'll play this little video out very, very quickly because it's worthwhile seeing. This is the bony septum. There's a whole cartilaginous part of the nose which is in front of it. There's the bony septum. There's the inferior turbinate. As we come in, there's the floor of the nose down there. These are the bony structures. This is the middle turbinate here, and we'll come and see all this again. See how you can see into the maxillary sinus? You don't normally see that in real life because it's all covered by mucosa. This is the uncinate here. Um, as we go back, so there's the there's little drainage area. This is all covered with a sheet of mucosa in real life, as is the back part of this area. So you can't see into the maxillary sinus. There's the back of the nose, and there's a little artery that comes in. So when you have a quick look at someone with all their sort of clothes on, I guess, um, this is what it looks like. So you have a whole cartilaginous nose that sits on top of that bony anatomy. There we are now looking at the level of the inferior turbinate septum, middle turbinate. There's that little cleft in there. See how you can't see into the sinus anymore? And you go all the way to the back here. This person's a little bit congested and everything. So you can see the cobblestoning and the turbinate's a bit chunky. Um, this, they've got sort of chronic allergy. And what we're going to do is, that's the eustachian tube, the soft palate at the back. And we're going to put a little instrument in here and just show you that middle meatal area where the sinus is drained into. Only takes a couple of seconds. Here we go. So in here, there's that uncinate. And you can see how there's a big sheet of mucosa all over there. This little cleft here is where the mucosa, mucus drains out of. So that's, that's what a normal anatomy looks like. Let's talk about this then. Going back to this area, if we're at that area, we've forgotten about the whole cartilaginous part of the nose that sits on top. And this is really important because there's a tendency of people to put this scope in, put their speculum in, and just see the turbinate and the septum and away they go. That's their assessment. But in people who complain of nasal blockage, it's important to remember the front two centimeters of the nose because this is where we have a cartilaginous doorway, often referred to as the nasal valve, which is the entrance to the nose. So the external nasal valve is made up of the septum, the ala rim, and the lateral crust, plus some fibro fatty tissue. So if you grab this part of the nose here, there's no cartilage and it's just sort of fibro fatty tissue. This is what we call the external valve and the fourth, the, the sill of the nose. So just going through that again, septum, the lateral cartilage and that fibro fatty tissue along with the sill, this triangle is what we call the external valve. 
And when you look at a normal external valve, this is, see this nubbin of cartilage there with the pairs? This area where the haired part of the skin is, is called the external valve. And in some people, it sags, especially with age or previous trauma, and it sits on the septum. And it is the sole cause of that person's breathing problem. You can look in and you might see a bit of allergy or minor turbinate problem, but that is the sole cause. And you can see in this person here, that's what their nose looks like in front, but it's this bit here which actually is restricting airflow. Um, a little bit, unfortunately, it is an age-related thing. We see some of this happen in people when they hit their about 50s and 60s. You know, it's like, unfortunately, the, the rest of our elasticity of our skin and cartilage. That's why we don't look 21 anymore. Things begin to sag, and this is true for the nose. And I always tell patients, like the caricature of an old man with a droopy nose, you can guarantee you didn't look like that at 21. Something that's happened over time. And if you have a sporting injury, previous rhinoplasty, previous trauma, this accelerates that collapse of those tissues. The internal nasal valve, traditionally the sort of narrowest point, is made up by the upper lateral cartilage, the, the septum, and the turbinate. So this area here now is what we refer to as the nasal valve. So because you, you don't really breathe, breathe, I should say, up through your sinuses, your breathing space in terms of the internal nasal valve is this green area here, and it's really made up by how big your turbinate is, the position of your septum, and the side wall of your nose, the, the upper lateral cartilage. And, and that is a natural narrowest point here. So this person here has a very subtle septal deviation off to one side, but essentially near normal. And you can see that edge of the cartilage there. It doesn't have any hairs on it, so it's, so it's um, hairless. And that's how you sort of tell that, that you're at the internal valve. And you can see, you can imagine here, this person's got a bit of a turbinate hypertrophy, the septum, and this cleft actually becomes the narrowest point to the nose. And so it's good to assess that area. The internal valve, though, is less susceptible to age-related collapse alone. If usually there's collapse of it, like this person, it's almost always trauma, trauma or previous surgery. This is an example of someone who's hairless part of their nose. You can see the haired part is still sitting out here somewhere, but the hairless part is collapsed right down. We might move on from that. Um, sometimes you get a mix of both things. We talk about the, the valve being narrow, but as it gets narrow, it sucks in a little bit. So there's two concepts. One concept is you have a fixed obstruction, what we call a stenosis, where it's just narrow. And the other the concept is a dynamic, is that it collapses when you inspire. The, the problem with that black and white description is that actually, as it gets narrower, you begin to suck a bit more, like a straw, you get a Bernoulli effect. And so everyone who has a slightly narrow valve gets a bit of collapse, it's where the tissues suck in. And so it's one of those situations where uh, it, we call it dysfunction when there's a bit of a mix of a narrow nose and a collapsing nose. And so you often hear people not try to put their finger and say exactly is it collapsing or is it narrow? And they will say, look, it's a dysfunctional valve because the two things happen together. And here's, here's a girl who's got exactly that. So when you look in the nose, you've got this really tiny nose. And I think we've got her inspiring here. Maybe we have. And as you can imagine with that tiny little cleft, when she inspires, it sucks down. And she, unfortunately, as you'll have a look here, it's a good example. She's had previous turbinate and septal surgery and everything else done. And you can see she's got a bit of allergy. But none of that is really what's causing her blockage on that side. I'm going to go through this. What about the septum? The septum should look nice and straight like this. If you see a little ridge here, that's the maxillary crest, so something that tells you the septum's not right. And sometimes septums will deviate right at the front of the nose, usually from trauma. Deviations that are in the nose are usually developmental. And this is why for some people we end up doing sort of external septal surgery to sort of fix this. You can imagine this person comes in plenty of blockage on one side. If you ever see this little structure here, see there's like a little pit. This is referred to as the vomeronasal organ, Jacobson's organ. It's cranial nerve zero. Uh, it's thought to be a remnant, a vestigial remnant, from um, a time when we had a strong pheromone perception. Uh, and it's still present in like elk and moose and things like that. It still has brain connections. Um, but, but in humans, there's thought not to be any more connections to the cranial cavity. So they've done studies to show that it's essentially just an isolated pit. It doesn't actually have any cranial connections as it does in other animals that have strong pheromone perception. But sometimes you'll see it and it's a giant pit. 
and you have to realize that. I've even had someone sent to me as an ulcer or a lesion. It's just a big vomeronasal organ. So let's just, I'm just play this video out and we'll just do this one um, before we move on to the sinuses. So this is the external valve over here, just showing you where it sits. So that little nubbin of cartilage is the normal external valve and, and it should sit more, f more lateral than anything else. So that's about right. As we go in then, we can see the septum here on this side. There's the inferior turbinate going through there. There's inferior turbinate. And then here's that upper lateral cartilage up here. So that's me wiggling the external valve, the, the lower lateral cartilage as it was referred to. And there's that smooth, hairless upper lateral cartilage. You'll see us in the nose. So it's worth having a good look because people like this um, who have, do have some degree of turbinate hypertrophy, if their front of the nose looks like this, they probably don't have um, a problem with blockage from their turbinate hypertrophy. They've got it because they have nasal valve collapse. And that's why this first two centimeters of the nose is very important. Now, I'm gonna move on now and just talk about the rest of the structures. Does anyone have any questions about that so far? No, nope. we'll go on. Let's move on. Yeah. Yeah, so, so people have nasal valve collapse. There's a this is where the world of all those devices you see, breathe right strips, there's external, what we call external dilators, where that you put them on the outside of the nose and they hold your nose open. This is where some of those devices where you put in the nose and open up, help to open the nose. And there's a whole market really over the counter for these products. And some people don't mind using them because they just use them at night time or when they exercise. And that's a really easy way to overcome the mechanical collapse. But if that doesn't work or it's just not tolerated or it's they get it all the time, we, we do rhinoplastic surgery. So it's sort of like a rhinoplasty, but the whole goal of the surgery may not be to change the nose shape at all, but simply just to reinforce those normal soft tissue and cartilaginous attachments to re-establish that valve. Make sure it's wide enough and make sure it doesn't sag or, or um, suck in. So, but there's no in-between. They really have to use internal external dilators or or surgery. Um, let's have a look at the middle turbinate. So this is this structure here. If we have a look then, what, when we look in a camera, so there's the m inferior turbinate down here. This structure is called the middle turbinate. And really, if there's anything you take away from endoscopy, don't you think, Stewie, it's, it's actually, if you can have just one view of this area here, you could probably make the diagnosis of about 80% of conditions, don't you agree? And so, here on the left hand side, that's the cleft that leads into the sinuses. This leads up to the olfactory cleft and there's a superior turbinate in the distance there. So that's really important. Um, the superior turbinate, it's further in the distance. So here's at the front of the nose, there's our floor inferior, inferior turbinate. There's our middle turbinate. We've got this middle meatus. See in here now, if we look in here, you can see it just up in the distance. And if we look with an angled camera, you can see there's the superior meatus, the superior turbinate, the middle turbinate, the inferior turbinate. So sometimes you get a view there. Why the superior turbinate? Well, let's go through this. This is the patient's right hand side. There's the inferior, there's the middle, there's the superior turbinate. And it's important because the inferior meatus, this space here takes the fluid from the nasolacrimal duct, so our tear duct. This space here collects maxillary, anteriorethmoid and frontal sinuses. And then this space here collects the posterior ethmoid and medial to it is the sphenoid. So you almost get a hint about what's going on in terms of pathology and if you look with a camera, this is what you see. That's inferior, middle, and superior turbinate with a superior meatus just there. That's that spot right there, just there. Um, the olfactory cleft is this space up here. And it's worth having a look because I should say there's the olfactory fibers coming out through the skull base. And sometimes you'll see things in the olfactory cleft. Sometimes we get these things called olfactory polyps. Well, th this is still open for debate about what this is, but, but we often refer to this as rhea. So it's called a respiratory epithelial adenomatous hyperplasia, or hematoma, I should say. And what we believe it is, it's hematomatous um, glandular tissue within the olfactory cleft, just below the neurectoderm. And this is the reason why some people lose their smell very easily and have minor changes. Um, you can, this is what example looks like on an MR. See, it's all enhancing. It's just an inflammatory change. And they get this very thickened tissue in the absence of any other sinus disease. Um, sometimes you'll see tumours like this. So this is an example of someone with an olfactory neuroblastoma. So there's a jelly-like red, strawberry red Sorry. mass. <laughs> it's okay, Stu. <laughs> Very rarely 
do we do MRs for people with smell loss? And, and the reality is that we're not looking for this. So if you said to me, people come to me with smell loss, I'm not really screening them for some terrible olfactory groove meningioma or some other tumour. I'm really doing it to assess olfactory bulb volume and other brain volumes for, for more common reasons why people lose their smell and to isolate the, the pathway involved. Um, of course, you want to exclude something like this, but it's, un it's unusual. Um, let's go now and talk about the paranasal sinuses. So we talked about having an anterior group that drain through the middle meatus, that's the frontal maxillary anterethmoid. We have a posterior group and a, uh, that drain through the superior meatus and then the sphenoid at the back. So let's have a look at these. You know, what are they? They're just air-filled spaces. I have a whole talk about why we have them. That's still really super open for debate. Many of the theories put forward about resonance, thermal protection, um, uh, mechanical protection, re um, odorant um, storage, None of these really hold up. Um, weight distribution, if you look at actually replacing sinuses compared to cancellous bone, there's very little benefit there. Um, it's not a flotation device for our head in the aquatic ape theory. You know, there's, there's a whole lot of things that have been put forward and actually not all primates have sinuses. So like baboons don't have sinuses and they're not critical for health. So you can tracheostomize someone and have their airway work from a tracheostomy and they don't suffer ill effects. There's a, there's a slight hydration, the trachea gets a little dry, but they, it's not critical for lung function either. Um, so that's the list of all those sort of phenomenon and that have been put forward, but none has really held up to sort of test. So let's have a look at this, this um, sinus opening here. So the first thing here is that this is the middle meatus, the normal middle meatus here. I'm gonna go through this really quickly. That's that space there. So that's when we're looking, that's we're looking in this cleft here. That's because the fluid comes out from the maxillary anterethmoid and frontal, and that's about there on a scan. And here you can actually sometimes make out, there's middle turbinate, there it is there, there's the uncinate, and that's the uncinate there. So you can see some of these tiny little clefts. And of course then, you'll sometimes see holes in that. That's not the natural drainage pathway. We call that just a perforation or a um, secondary ostium. It's just where the, that mucosal sheet has broken down. We still, we still don't know whether that's just a developmental thing or maybe a sign of previous sinus infections, but you'll see that, but that's not the natural drainage pathway. And here you can see this little outflow pathway just here. So that's what we're looking at. And let's have a look at some examples of some pathology then. So this is someone who's got an acute maxillary sinusitis on that side compared to their other side. Can you see how this sort of pus and edema? So not surprisingly, their scan looks like this. Almost always in people who have normal sinuses, when they get recurrent acute sinusitis, it's one side. They rarely get it symmetrically or magically both sides at the same time. The minute someone says to me, I get bilateral pressure, bilateral congestion, bilateral discharge, it's some sort of allergy or inflammatory event for sure. They're not connected, the left and right sides. And to have something synchronously happen every time is sort of beyond logic. That's for people who have normal sinuses in between. Different category if you have a chronic inflammatory state. Let's have a look here. So here's someone, um, this is that person looking in. So here's a normal right hand side and we'll have a look and see what it looks like in someone who has um, an affected acute inflammation. You can see the sort of pus coming out of that area. That's very typical for this situation. Let's move on. There's pus here. Another example, this is a subacute thing, so it's been going on for a few months. You can actually see the mucosa is really chunky now with pus and it's sort of pulsating. It would be very typical so for, for a, a unilateral maxillary sinus, which is grumbling and continuing on. Um, here's a more chronic state where there's ongoing mucus streaming out of that area. So it's, you don't see that acute inflammation quite so much. Sometimes the classic post-nasal drip coming down into someone's throat from an infected left side. This is sort of unusual cord for post-nasal drip, but, but we see it. And that's when we've done surgery for such a procedure, for such an indication where someone's had unilateral disease, you can actually now see what's happened surgically. You just made a tiny opening to wash out the sinus and overcome the problem in that sinus cavity. The frontal outflow is right next to that area as well. Um, means that if you have a frontal sinusitis, so this person had a cold for a few weeks and then started to develop right frontal pain, and acutely you can actually see a little bit of pus coming in here. So you don't even need a CT scan to see what's happening and why they've got right frontal pain. Um, the sphenoid sinus is right at the back. So see this little opening just here, just creeping out. So there it is there. So that's the sphenoid sinus opening, just there. 
Um, so someone who has a condition like this, a little bit of fungal material, that's what that white stuff is, if you look at them, sometimes you'll see pus draining down from that natural ostium right at the back of the nose where we know the sphenoid sinus drains. And here's that video of that person, and this is where I might wrap it up, Stewie, and get you to follow me if, you, if you're good. Um, you can see a little bit of pus coming out of that superior, there's the superior turbinate, just medial to the superior turbinate, there's a little bit of pus. That's very useful because when people come and see us with minor sinus changes in the sphenoid and then say to me, but Richard, I, I get this headache that comes for a couple of weeks and then disappears. If, if we have a minor sinus change and then see them during the period they have the headache and you look in and you can actually see active inflammation, it makes me very confident with the patient saying, listen, that's probably the cause then and it's worth us correcting the sinus abnormality.